Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first program of September at the Alice Paul Institute. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alyssa Hunt. I am the program director here at API, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that while we are not at API today, the land that it sits on is traditionally the home of the Nanakoke Lenni Lenape people and we honor them in their relationship with this land and their ongoing history and continued presence here. Um, it is, I'm so excited today to welcome Kim Todd, who is here with us. Are you, are you at home right now in Minneapolis? I am. This is my attic. Welcome to oh, my hey. attic. <laughs> so Kim is joining us from Minneapolis, where she serves on the MFA faculty at the University of Minnesota. Kim is an award-winning author of multiple books, including Chrys Chrysalis, Maria Sibylla Marion and the Secrets of Metamorphosis, and Tinkering with Eden, A Natural History of Exotic Species in America. Uh, she has had her writing appear in Smithsonian, Salon, Sierra Magazine, Orion, and Best American Science and Nature Writing, and has, among other things, won a Penn Gerard Award and Sigurd Olson Nature Writing Award. So I am so interested to hear what brought you from more like nature and like ethnobotanical writing into um, historical writing about women's issues. But I first read um, about this book in the Smithsonian article that kind of previewed the topic. So I'm going to let Kim tell you more about it, but the book we are talking about today is Sensational, The Hidden History of America's Girl Stunt Reporters. If like me, you learned about Nellie Bly in American history class in high school, then you already know a little bit about this fascinating topic. So Kim, I am going to turn it over to you. You should be able to share your screen. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Let's see if this is gonna work. Uh... Okay, you guys seeing what you should see? Good, I, I will assume yes. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me and for taking the time to come to listen to talk for me talk about my most recent book, Sensational, The Hidden History of America's Girl Stunt Reporters. Um, and as Alyssa mentioned, I am on the MFA faculty um, at the University of Minnesota and where I teach creative nonfiction. Um, and most of my books have dealt with science and history um, and the combination between the two. Um, and this one is definitely still about history, um, but I'm a little more writing about writing, um, but I just got completely sucked into it and I can talk more about how I made that switch later um, if you guys like. So I think the best introduction to the book is maybe just the opening. Um, so I'm gonna read the opening um, and then I will give an overview of the project and show some slides. And I hope at the end, you guys will ask me some questions because I think these things are really the best um, if it's more of a dialogue or a conversation. Okay, so the start of Sensational. In late November, of 1888, a young woman threaded her way through the grit-filled streets of Chicago's downtown, skirting horse-strong cabs and wagons teetering with sacks of grain. When she finally arrived at the doctor's office, she sat hot-faced in the waiting room while her companion pulled the doctor aside and explained the nature of the problem. The physician, small and alert like a sparrow, turned to the girl and tried to calm her, you mustn't be scared about it, the doctor urged. It's perfectly safe. You'll suffer more from fright than you would the operation. The patient, still agitated, put off a full examination. She'd come back another day, she promised, to arrange the abortion. A few days later, the young woman visited a different doctor. This one had a German accent and a diploma from a German university under crossed swords on his wall. She described her situation, saying she was from Memphis and like many girls, she'd taken the train to Chicago because of its reputation. 
Then she haltingly made her request. Did she have any other health problems? The doctors asked. Was she in pain? When she said no to both, he wrote her a prescription for ergot, a fungus thought to endorse premature labor. She should go to the hotel, he said, draw a warm bath, drink a hot toddy, and take two teaspoons full. Don't follow the dosage written on the prescription, the doctor warned, because it was wrong. Otherwise, the pharmacist might get suspicious about the drug's true purpose. The physician looked her in the eye, handed her the slip of the paper, and said, remember how to take it tonight. Do not be alarmed if it produces pain, and sent her back out into the hectic city. She went to another doctor after that, and another. In the course of three weeks, she visited more than 200 physicians. Many agreed to perform an abortion, a surprising number as it was illegal. The police department surgeon, Dr. C.C.P. Silva, plump with a black goatee, highlighted the danger. Inflammation might set in, and Lord knows what might follow. Then he swore her to secrecy and said he'd do it for $75. The head of the Chicago Medical Society rocked back on his heels saying, there are enough ways in this state for a man to get into the penitentiary without taking a crowbar and prying his way in and refused to do it. But then he gave her directions to a man who would. Hundreds of girls have had abortions, a female physician assured her and added, it will not do for you to feel so timid. You must feel daring and brave. Though one physician suspected she was an adventuress, none knew she was actually an undercover reporter bent on revealing the extent of the city's abortion practice. When her expose, a month long project for the Chicago Times hit the stands, the city editor quit in disgust. Letters of praise and outrage flooded into the news desk, lawsuits for libel piled high. Discussions of abortion in a daily paper Readers found it repellent and irresistible. They found the message hard to decipher. On the one hand, the writer referred to only as the girl reporter condemned abortion in the strongest terms. On the other, she published detailed instructions for how and where to get one, including which medicine to take and at what dosage. A heated discussion blazed through the editorial pages about women's bodies and the power imbalance between the sexes. The Chicago Times girl reporter might seem exceptional in her readiness to risk scandal and tell a story no one else would, but she was not alone. The same script was playing out in cities from coast to coast. She was just one of the nation's girl stunt reporters, pioneering a new genre of investigative journalism, going undercover to reveal societal ills. Throughout the 1880s and 1890s, women from Colorado to Missouri to Massachusetts dressed in shabby clothes and snuck into textile mills to report on factory conditions, slipped behind the scenes at corrupt adoption agencies, fainted in the street to test public treatment at public hospitals. So the book covers um, the rise and fall of this decade long period of investigative journalism. And it makes the argument that these women created the form, which Tom Wolfe would later describe as new journalism, as well as the field now labeled creative nonfiction or literary nonfiction, though their accomplishments were later disparaged and eventually forgotten. I went into the book with several questions and one of them was why were these reporters and their contributions so easily forgotten? Um, and another was, who was the girl reporter of the Chicago Times who wrote the abortion expose? When I talk about the genre of girl stunt reporters, I mean writing that was referred to at the time by a number of different names. So girl reporters or sensation reporters or stunt reporters. Um, it's a dismissive term for what should just be called innovative investigative reporting, but I find it useful to delineate the writing by women of this time period. So the story breaks easily into three sections, um, starting roughly in 1887. And so in that year, Nellie Bly, who you may know from your history class, I hope you do, I actually didn't learn about her until much later, um, went undercover into the Blackwell's Island Insane Asylum. So Nellie Bly grew up in Western Pennsylvania 
And when she was a teenager and young adult, um, like many women of the time period, she was desperate for a job. She had started out going to college for teaching and then ran out of money and didn't have any luck at any of the places, other places that she looked. They either um, paid very little or weren't hiring or didn't think she was strong enough for factory work. Um, she ended up finally getting a job at the Pittsburgh Dispatch, where she worked for a number of years, but they quickly moved her to writing for the women's page, which she found really unsatisfying, kind of covering society balls and the latest fashions and women's dress sleeves. And so she eventually went to New York, where the most exciting journalism was happening at the time. Um, and she went like full of bravado that she was gonna get a job there and do this amazing work. And there also she had a really hard time finding a job. Um, that was until she assigned herself the story of reporting how all of these New York newspaper editors felt about women in journalism. So she went and interviewed all the editors and one of them said, well, I will consider giving you a job if you think you can fake your way into Blackwell's insane asylum for women and report on what you find there. And Bly, who's pretty desperate at this time, was like, well, I'll give it a try and see what I can do. Um, so here's the asylum. And at the time that she went in, there was rumors that um, the patients were treated very poorly there. Um, and the story was not just explosive when she ultimately revealed it because of what she found there, but also the fact that she was willing to do it. The fact of the bravery of this young woman going into this situation really made it a big story. And part of the reason that people responded that way was because of the way that she inserted herself into the story and made herself a sympathetic character. So here's an illustration of why getting into character, preparing to um, you know, act insane in a way that would get her committed to the asylum, which she eventually does, and she spends 10 days there. Um, one of the really innovative things about Bly was, again, not just what she reported, but how she reported it. She creates these vivid, complicated characters. She writes in scenes in the way that you would find in a novel, so you're always like reading to find what happens next. She has this engaging narrator who's very personable, who's very funny. It's very long form journalism, what she would, we would call now long form journalism. Um, by the time she's done with her expose, the newspaper articles create an entire book. Um, and she includes a lot of dialogue, which again, makes it incredibly readable. And her style is just very straightforward. Um, she writes, on the 22nd of September, I was asked by the world if I could have myself committed to one of the asylums for the insane in New York with a view to writing a plain and unvarnished narrative of the treatment of patients therein and the methods of management. Did I think I had the courage to go through such an ordeal as the mission would demand? I said I believed I could. I had some faith in my own acting ability and thought I could assume insanity long enough to accomplish the mission entrusted to me could I pass a week in the insane ward at Blackwell's Island? I said I could, I would, and I did. Um, so this very straightforward, accessible style, different from if you think of a lot of 19th century writing, you think of long sentences, you think of ornate clauses, and she just got right to the point. Um, so almost immediately, there was an intense newspaper response. Um, partially was a real world response that resulted in more money for the asylum, um, better food. Editors responded and that all of a sudden they thought, wow, this kind of reporting can really sell a lot of copies. Um, I would like to hire myself a girl stunt reporter. Women all over the country who were looking for jobs as Bly had been were like, wow, this seems like really interesting work. I would like to be a girl stunt reporter. Um, and readers were really taken with the story. Here were these engaging stories that read like novels. And also they, um, because they were written by women, they reported on 
places that only women would have had access. So all of a sudden you could see inside a women's insane asylum, you could see inside a factory where mostly women worked. So I'm showing you these two examples of newspaper response. Um, one is the Buffalo Daily News, um, which says under the subhead, she journalist talks about that in the wake of Bly, any number of young women are seeking to find their way into New York newspaper work. There is hardly an editor in New York who is not bothered with young women who want to disguise themselves and go into unusual places with the idea of making newspaper stories out of their experiences. And across the country, the Spokane Review, the author says that he has received inquiries from girls all over about his recent lecture about journalism. And they wanna know more about the duties required of young ladies who join the staff of a newspaper. And he's very much making fun of them. He's saying, oh, they all wanna know if you know, they can expense their seal skin coats because they might have to go out in the rain. Um, but even though he's making fun of them, he's also making the point about this huge flood of interest that comes after Bly does her stunt. Um, so it really starts this explosion of writing opportunities for women to do this kind of work. A few months after Bly's asylum expose, Helen Cusack, who wrote under the alias Nell, Nell Nelson, she's pictured here, did a lengthy series for the Chicago Times on working women. She went into factories where they're making feather dusters, shoes, cloaks. Um, she writes about an early multi-level marketing scheme where these women are essentially paying for the privilege of crocheting materials, which then it turns out that no one really wants. Um, she charts pervasive sexual harassment in the factories. Um, one instance she writes about, um, she forgets her streetcar fare on her way to a job. She borrows it from a man who then follows her off the streetcar and is pestering her for her address, um, pressing uncomfortably up against her at one point. And finally, she offers him her card, which identifies her as a Chicago Times reporter. Um, and then he claims to like have an appointment and rushes away. The factory conditions are very hot. They're very dirty. Um, and a lot of the people that she sees working there are very young. Um, and she writes it all down. And the Chicago Times, as you can see, thinks that her reporting is incredibly valuable and something that they wanna do advertisements for. The Chicago Times during the coming week will pile up the testimony against the rascals who are engaged in pauperizing female labor in this city. The Chicago Times has evidence enough on hand to convict the factory proprietors of the most contemptible and cowardly species of tyranny ever exercised over the human beings in this community. The Chicago Times is not afraid to hold these wretches up to public execration. It uses no fictitious names and does not hesitate to point out plainly the ruffians it is engaged in exposing. So like Bly's, Nell's series was incredibly popular. It resulted in a lot of letters to the editor debating conditions for working women. Um, and Nelson was successful enough that she is hired by Pulitzer's New York World, the same paper that had published Bly. So here you see the world touting her work. Um, she repeated her series there going into New York factories and reporting on what she found. Um, and Nell's, Nell Nelson's style was different from Bly's. She was known for having a particularly caustic pen. And here's the end of one of her pieces for the world. When a family of eight can thrive in one room, when, the five, cents, when five cents a day will board the father and half a pound of prunes with butcher's scraps, provide a soup for the maintenance of wife and children, when $3 is accepted as fair compensation for seven days of labor of 11 hours each, when a foul smelling, overheated, ill-ventilated, ratty fire trap is regarded as an ideal workshop, then it seems that the time has come for action of some kind. Um, and her work did spur action, not quite ready for the next one yet, and her work did spur action um, Illinois passed a factory act partially as a result of her work, and after she moved to New York, she campaigned for and achieved female factory inspectors to report on conditions in factories where mostly women worked. 
So here's Winifred Sweet, another person who walked through the door of opportunity that Bly opened. Across the country, she was getting her start at the San Francisco Examiner. So Sweet originally wanted to be an actress and she left school to join a traveling theater troupe, but her career as an actress wasn't exactly taking off. Um, she'd written some very funny letters back home to her sister in Chicago though, um, and her sister had been observing reporters like Nell and the success that the success that they were having in Chicago. And her sister wondered like, oh, well, can I, can I channel this energy that Winifred has into maybe a more reputative career of being a journalist? Um, so when Winifred took a trip to San Francisco, she with her sister's encouragement showed up at the San Francisco examiner's, examiner offices looking for a job. So the examiner was owned by the young William Randolph Hearst, a Harvard dropout bankrolled by his father's mining money. Hearst greatly admired Pulitzer's The World. He had worked there for a brief time, trying to learn as much as he could. And his great desire was to imitate its strategies for success and then surpass it. He and Sweet hit it off immediately. And in early 1890, Sweet went undercover for the first time. There had been reports of terrible things happening at the locally, local public hospital, particularly to women. Sweet emptied her purse of identification and put belladonna drops in her eyes to widen the pupils. And then she stumbled off a streetcar pretending to feel ill and then fainted in the street so she could be picked up by the police and taken to the public hospital. At the hospital, she was treated and mistreated by a doctor named Harrison who diagnosed her with hysteria, um, which he proposed to cure with abuse. Poor people brought to the public hospital were assumed to be poor and friendless and thus particularly prone to mistreatment. So here is Sweet's original story called The City's Disgrace and a follow-up story with the result that Dr. Harrison was removed from the hospital. Her career was off and running and it was clear that Hearst saw in her a potential answer to Nellie Bly. And you can really see that here. Um, oh, skipped. Okay, so you can really see that here. On the one side is a photograph of Nellie Bly when she's doing her stunt a couple of years later where she went around the world in record time. Um, and she had this very iconic traveling outfit which include this checked coat. And then here you see an illustration in the San Francisco Examiner of Winifred Sweet. Um, and the illustration shows her in an identical checked coat. So hopefully, or they were both hoping that it would sort of ring that bell in a reader's mind. Um, but she did eventually step out of Nellie's shadow and did a lot of valuable reporting on her own, um, becoming one of the examiner's lead reporters, including one series where she documented um, the amount of poisonous chemicals in cosmetics that were being advertised and sold to women. A final reporter from this period that I wanted to highlight is Victoria Earl Matthews. Matthews was the daughter of a woman who had escaped from slavery and brought her children to New York. She, she got her start in the place that many female reporters did, writing household hints and then branching out into plays and fiction. She was highlighted along with many of the other reporters, including Nell Nelson and Ida B. Wells, in an 1889 issue of The Journalist, um, which said that she contributed to many of the largest papers of the day and commented, no writer of the race is kept busier. As a black woman, the role of girl stunt reporter wasn't available to her, even if it was one that she would have wanted. Um, it was a role played by white women for white owned newspapers, but she contributed equally in innovative investigative reporting. In 1895, she paid a visit to the South. And while she was there, she observed the way that employment agencies preyed on young black women trying to escape the South to New York. They would offer them a free trip on the northbound ship and lodging until they found work, but the women then would find themselves in debt um, when they got to the North to these employment agencies, both for the transportation and the rent and the good jobs never materialized. 
um, and they often ended up in prostitution. So Matthews essentially uncovered and then publicized this form of human trafficking. Um, and here is a, an excerpt of a talk that she gave on this topic at the Hampson Institute conference. So the next period um, comes at the end of this first part of the genre, which is this undercovered, socially engaged work um, that blossomed in the wake of Wise Exposé. And then in 1895, things started to change. So one of the major things that happened was that William Randolph Hearst of The Examiner, the employer of Winifred Sweet, decided to compete with Pulitzer on his own turf and bought a newspaper in New York. And he told key members of his staff, including Winifred Sweet, to get on a train east. They arrived at the end of 1895 and they set off an epic newspaper battle between the journal, which was Hearst's paper, and the world. They competed for circulation by making their papers cheaper, by adding more and more pages, by sending out their reporters to try to solve murders, um, and by including larger illustrations and comics, and by hiring many, many stunt reporters. So, Here's an image from that time period. And as you can see, the images change from that really kind of rough sketch of Nellie Bly standing in front of a mirror, preparing to go into the asylum to these much more elaborate things. Many of these stories relied less on undercover investigations, though they still happened, um, and more on feats of physical strength and bravery, testing what it was considered possible for a woman to do. So here's Kate Swan, one of the world's most popular reporters of 1896, scaling the Harlem River Bridge to place a coin on top to indicate that she'd been there. So note also in this picture, her exposed ankles, which were almost as scandalous as the feet itself. So not to be outdone, here's Ava Patterson for the competitor of the journal in a submarine for the New York Journal in 1897. And here is Dorothy Dare, again for the world, taking a wild ride in a snowplow. So on the one hand, this shift was a bit of a setback for these women. Their work was no longer having a significant impact in terms of changing a law or pushing workers to go on a strike. While early on, the women controlled their own brands, a story by Nellie Bly or Nell Nelson, or Annie Laurie, which was Winifred Sweet's pseudonym, had a specific marketable value and that control shifted. A number of women started to write under um, group pseudonyms. Like there was a few who wrote under the name Journal Woman or Meg Merrilies, and that made it much more difficult to establish a career. And this kept the brand in control of the publishers. Also, the excitement of doing this kind of work kind of turned into a bit of a, an imprisoning expectation. So one reporter who had spent several years in England arrived in the US hoping to cover the presidential campaign, only to find that she had a hard time finding an assignment that didn't involve her trying to get arrested as a prostitute and spending the night in jail and reporting on that experience. People grew increasingly frivolous of this kind of work and it was genuinely increasingly frivolous. But on the other hand, the journal and the world were flush with money and they kept trying to steal each other's best reporters, meaning that the salaries were at an all time high. There were also many more women in newsrooms than at the start of the decade and they began to create a sense of community. Many of them did have the chance to cover campaigns and interview political figures. And also taking the very long view, I think if you look, you can see that these highly illustrated stories of women having adventures were the progenitors of comic strip heroines like Lois Lane and Brenda Starr. And the image of like the intrabid girl reporter, which had a long life and inspired many writers. So 1898 is what I would define as the final year of like the heyday of this genre. And several things occurred then. 
when was that early in the year textile workers in New Bedford, Massachusetts went on strike. Many of the most high profile male reporters and at the world and the journal were covering rebels in Cuba who were trying to free the island from Spanish control, a conflict that both papers hoped the US would join. As a result, both papers sent many female reporters to cover the New Bedford strike, which looked like it might spread throughout New England. The reporter from England went, Kate Swan, the one who's hanging off the bridge went, and many more. One of these was Eva McDonald Valesh, who had gone under to cover into factories at the time of Mel Nelson. She had been writing for the journal anonymously, but now, as you can see in this um, image here, they were highlighting her personality and her name and her expertise on labor issues. You see her described here as an international labor commissioner and the small pictures lower down, um, you can't quite see all of them, um, but one is her dressed up as a shop girl, one is her as a reporter. And this assignment really gave all the women a chance to shine and hone their voices. The reporter from England wrote up a sociological portrait of the women textile workers, the ways they supported each other, including opening a cooperative daycare. Kate Swan hired on as a weaver and exposed practices in the factories that spread disease. Eva McDonald Valesh went and interviewed President McKinley about his opinion of the strike and the strikers. Um, and it always gives me somewhat of a pause to think that these women couldn't vote, but that this kind of work enabled them to interview the president. So just then, as the new Bedford story really started to unfold, the battleship Maine exploded in the Cuban harbor. So uncertainty over the cause of the explosion, almost none of what the journal prints here on this, uh, on this front page will be borne out, um, resulted in the US launching the Spanish-American War that April. Um, and this ended the era of the girl stunt reporter for a number of reasons. First was that neither paper would assign women to cover the war, um, which was the only story that the papers were interested in and wanted to cover all of a sudden. So female combat reporters was a step too far. Um, so those, particularly those women without a regular job at the papers, um, not very much to do. Second, the reporting of the war was very overhyped. And in some cases, again, as you can see in this headline, um, which indicates that it was a torpedo, when it was done, critics would apply the term yellow journalism to this kind of reporting and make the effort to distance themselves from it and kind of throw this kind of reporting in the trash, defining good journalism as everything that was sober and objective and impersonal. Hearst and Pulitzer and their papers were most associated with, with this kind of reporting as were the women who were employed by them. As newspaper editor W.C. Braun wrote at the time, a careful examination of the great dailies will demonstrate that at least half of the intellectual slime that is troubling the land is fished out of the gutter by females. So you probably can't read here in this cartoon, Puck Magazine, but in the center are um, Pulitzer there with the beard and Hearst who's sort of portrayed as a child, a little bit of a boy wonder. Money is pouring out between them um, and the public all around them is running around with newspapers in their hands and the headlines on the papers read, Life in Sing Sing, Splurge Reporter in Disguise, Nellie, Sply, Nellie Spy as a Flower Girl, and How Lunatics Are Treated, a Reporter of the Daily Splurge Spends a Week in an Asylum. So here's another illustration in Puck, which did not like Hearst and Pulitzer very much. And then the illustration is called The Cleansing of New York, and it shows the editors being tossed out by the long arm of the law. Even though um, 
even though their reputation at this time was sort of immediately disparaged and they were quickly forgotten, the legacy of the Girl Scout reporters was a long one. Um, investigative journalism, immersion journalism, activist journalism, new journalism, which was coined by Tom Wolfe in the 1970s, which um, was defined as pieces that used scenes, pieces that used lots of dialogue, pieces that had a distinct point of view of a narrator, um, and solutions journalism are all in their debt. Um, I hope that the reevaluation of the legacy of these early innovators will show us paths to considering women's lives and experiences as worthy of a front page, not siloed off on a women's page or in what is you know, called the style page, um, both then and now. Um, here are the credits for all those illustrations. Um, and again, I just would like to thank all of you for attending and the Alice Paul Institute for hosting. And I would love, as I said, to turn this more into a discussion um, by answering any questions that you might have. And I will stop sharing my screen now. Well, thank you so much. That was so interesting. And the illustrations are like, that's so fascinating. Um, so we have a couple of questions. I'm really like, there were, I mean, you just covered just so much ground. <laughs> I know that my, my experience, I mentioned Nellie Bly earlier, but uh, learning about Maureen Dallas Watkins and trying to break in who wrote the original book that became the play Chicago um, for people who don't know her. And she, they wanted her to be a society page writer, but she really wanted to be taken seriously and really struggled in the 1890s in Chicago for any, to have anyone that uh, thinks she could be a serious journalist because of her uh, gender. So um, with that, one of the first questions we have is, did the term stunt rep reporter apply exclusively to women? Um, I would say it applied mostly to women. There were men who did this kind of work. Um, you know, for example, William Randolph Hearst um, decided he wanted to see if there was any grizzly bears left in California. So he just like sent one of his, his male reporters off to like, oh, go catch a grizzly bear and bring it back. And so this poor guy like spent the whole summer um, in the mountains of California trying to catch a grizzly bear. So there, there were men doing stunts, but it wasn't as popular. Um, and it really was, um, so again, even though there was some men doing it, it really was a, a gendered genre and really was associated with women. Is there a sense that this is the only way women could be taken seriously um, as reporters? I mean, I don't know if even then, so the women doing the society page work were definitely not taken seriously. And I think like initially the women doing the kind of the stunt reporting and the disguise reporting were taken seriously, um, but then eventually they were not. And by the time of 1898, like even they are sounding sort of embarrassed and apologetic about it. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't, it was never quite reputable, right? You could be well respected and write for the women's page and not make any money, or you could do something slightly scandalous and do these stunts, which made a ton of money. Like Winifred Sweet at one time was reputed to be like the highest paid reporter for the San Francisco Examiner. Like it was, it was dangerous work both physically and in terms of reputation, um, but as a result, it was really well paid. So we have another question and I just wanna say, I saw some people raise their hands. If you put it in the Q and A, then I'll be sure to see it. Um, but what was the process like in getting access to these original art articles? Were they online? Were you like going and digging through the microfiche in library, in historical libraries or archives? I mean, it was interesting to watch because the project took a number of years and over the course of the time that I was working on the project, more and more papers began to be added to these online databases. Um, so even from the start of project to the end, um, there was more added. So I definitely like all appreciation to people who create the online search engines and online databases of these papers. 
You know, there was some big gaps though. Like there's gaps in years of the New York world, which aren't there. Hardly any of the New York Journal, so Hearst's New York paper. There's some at the Library of Congress, but it's not comprehensive at all. And the Chicago Times, which was so um, interesting, both for its abortion expose and the work of Nell Nelson, isn't available in any of those online databases. I think because like, it's just a terrible paper that nobody cares about with the exception of like this very small amount of very innovative work. Um, so that was all microfilm and um, yeah, it was a lot of time in the Chicago Public Library with the microfilm. Is, I guess, Chicago, is Chicago far from where you are? I've been to both cities, but not in a straight line, I guess. Um, it's a very quick plane flight. Okay. So, I mean, uh, sometimes I did go in the morning and come back at night, but more often I would arrange to spend a couple of days. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I might be getting my timelines confused. So if, forgive me if I am, but we have a question about Ida B. Tarbell and the relationship between these. Were these precursors to um, muckraking work or am, do I have my time backwards? Um, so just to flag, there was amazing journalism work done by two women named Ida at this time. So one is Ida B. Wells, who is like a pioneer of journalism about lynching and wrote mm -hmm. some like amazing, um, amazing documented lynching in a way that nobody else was doing. Then there was Ida Tarbell who wrote for McClure's magazine and wrote the expose of the Standard Oil Company and really like helped to bring down monopolies. And she was like, though she was working during that time, um, that particular expose was slightly later and as was the heyday of McClure's magazine and the work that we think of as muckrakers. So that's really like mostly like the early 19, the um, early 20th century. So, and this is like the late 19th century. Okay. So one of the things um, that stuck in my craw, which got me to start this project was that Girl stunt reporters were always talked about as like very dismissively and like this sort of silly thing, which we don't have to take seriously. While muckrakers was really deemed a term of respect now, right? Like it's a journalist do want to be like a modern day muckraker. Um, and to me, like it's all continuous. Like mm -hmm. there's no real difference to me um, between the work that, you know, Nellie Bly is doing and Ida, Ida Tarbell and most of the male journalists who are accredited with pioneering muckraking. That's such an interesting point that uh, we there's such an arbitrary distinction placed on who gets respect and whose work is valued um, and who we remember. Because girl stunt, it just, it seems so diminutive. It feels very dismissive. Um, so I, this is a question from me actually, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, you, you mentioned that people wanted more objective journalism, especially after the yellow journalism term got applied, but you also mentioned Tom Wolf a few times who really said objective journalism is a silly idea because it's not real and we should lean into the subjective. Do you have any thoughts on that, especially after doing all this research and writing this book? Yeah, so right after the period of yellow journalism, um, you started having journalism professionalizing, you started having journalism coming up with codes of ethics, you started having really like the first journalism schools like Missouri and um, Columbia School of Journalism both started um, around 1910, give or take a few years. And so, yeah, there was this big movement to like get the personal out of it, um, and sort of rein in all the crazy energy of yellow journalism. But what happens 70 years later is that Tom, well, six years later is that Tom Wolfe says like, oh, these conventions feel like a little staid. So what happens if we experiment with being more subjective, with writing things more as stories, with we really like, let ourselves sort of um, let go of the reins of what we think of as respectable journalism. Um, all of which I think is good. It just, um, he just didn't acknowledge that it had been done before. <laughs> well, that's, that's a fairly well-known trope too. Yeah. 
men having a brand new great idea <laughs> that women have been doing for nearly a century. Yeah. Is that, ans- that kind of leads to another question that we had of, did any of these women have formal journalism training? But it sounds like there, that wasn't a thing yet. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't. A few of them went to college um, of some form or other, um, but it was really interesting to note like a lot of the women had hardly any formal education at all, um, you know, beyond the high school level, like Nellie Bly. Um, but the men that were in the newsrooms with them had almost all gone to college and more often than not, they had gone to Harvard. So like, it was this really interesting um, mashup of, of the people in the newsrooms. But um, there, yeah, there, there, wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been formal journalism training. So for a lot of them, it was just the question of, you know, did they or did they not go to college? Um, and quite a few of the women didn't. Okay. Um, let's see, we have a question about um, the original, uh, the introduction and the abortion expose. Did that contribute to tightening restrictions? I know that's a very interesting history as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it did. It certainly it certainly came out of the effort to tighten restrictions um, and was part of that movement. But I don't think that that particular article led to the tightening of restrictions. I mean, I found the debate that happened in the op-ed pages totally fascinating and like the arguments are exactly the same as they are now. Like, it's a little dismaying. You know, people were talking about, well, um, this allows the men to get off scot-free and not have any consequences. And is that fair? We want equality for women. Um, you know, how does this help with that project? Just like this really fascinating, frank discussion about um, the imbalance between the sexes in terms of power was happening mm-hmm. in, the, in the op-ed pages. That's, I learned recently from a podcast about the postmaster who made the anti-lewdness laws. I can't oh, think of his name. Comstock. He's the re- yeah, the Comstock laws and how most of our anti-abortion laws really originated with him. Um, and it just, it's so fascinating to me. I know that's sort of a tangent, but um, a couple of people have asked if you could speak more about Ida B. Wells. Yes. So she is in the book. Um, I just didn't want to overwhelm with, um, you know, by giving you so many people to follow. I mean, she is really interesting because what she is doing is so markedly different from what the white reporters are doing. Um, At the same time, she is also able to write because of this period of opportunity. Um, And it was interesting for me that all of the reporters that I wrote about, Ida B. Wells included, were born during a very short time period. Like they were all born like during or right after the Civil War. So there's something going on there demographically um, where women who are like coming of age in the 1880s and the 1890s all of a sudden find that this this path is open to them. But what Wells had to do, because um, she wrote for a lot of black owned newspapers, which paid hardly anything. And even there, she felt like she was always having to bite her tongue and hold back what she really wanted to say. So the path through that she found was by owning her own papers. She owned a stake in this newspaper in Memphis, where she originally wrote some of her strong critiques of um, of lynching. She co-owned a paper with her eventual husband in Chicago. She self-published some of her books. Um, uh, and other times, you know, a group of women um, held a fundraiser and that was how her books were published. So she really had to take a lot of, um, a lot of back channels to get her work out there because of what she was saying was so deeply unpopular and shocking. Again, you know, not just to the Hearsts and the Pulitzers, but to like a huge swath of the population. Thank you. Um, that, I haven't gotten to that part of the book yet, but <laughs> I am excited to read that. We talk yeah. about her a lot because of her role in the suffrage parade right. um, at the Alice Hall Institute. So we had a few questions too about contemporary journalism and if there 
are like threads in journalism today, places to look for journalism that could compare to the stunt journalists of the past, or if there are any bylines you know of that are good to keep our eyes on? Sure. I mean, so I'll give you two examples that I include in the book. So one of the reporters that I wrote about, um, she did this experiment where she tried to live on $3 a week, which was like standard factory worker wage at the time. And she just charted like how difficult it was to make that work, you know, the like how hungry she was the entire week and how close she was to disaster. Like if she had to go to the doctor, like her budget would have been completely blown. And that really seemed to me so clearly echoed in work like Barbara Ehrenreich's Nickel and Dimed, where she's, you know, her project is deliberately, can I live for a year on minimum wage? And the answer is really no. Um, you know, and both of them are kind of putting their bodies on the line to take this test and coming to the same conclusion like these wages are unworkable for people in their lives. Um, so that seems like a, a contemporary example. A contemporary example, which perhaps um, shows other things which are continually an issue is that I talk about the work of Suki Kim, who was a reporter who went undercover in North Korea to work as a teacher in a school there. And she wrote a book called Without You, There Is No Us. And it's this really heroic work of investigative journalism where she went undercover to get a story that nobody else could get. But um, when she came back at when it was published, it was not treated as serious investigative journalism. It was treated as sort of like this woman going on a lark to North Korea. Um, and I like the headline in the New York Times, which was incredibly critical of her project was like tales told out of school, you know, just like this really infant infantilizing headline, again, not taking her work seriously. So I think that um, women still struggle to be taken seriously as investigative journalists. Um, and that's just a sad reminder of that. That's, it's so infuriating. Um, <laughs> it really was. We still have to fight really to was. be taken. Yeah. yeah, seriously in our careers. So another question we got was, if in your research for this, you encountered anyone else doing similar research or similar work or trying to bring these stories to the public eye or to the forefront? Is there, are there, did you find anyone else doing similar, a similar project or things that can, I, I mean, certainly like the women have been written about, you know, in different ways. There's amazing biographies of Bly, there's amazing biography of Wells, like some of the women that I talk about have individual biographies, um, which, you know, are well-researched and very revealing. I haven't, I didn't find anyone working on this specific project of um, telling the biography of this genre, like saying like this whole genre is like this unwritten chapter of journalism history and deserves to be included in the book of journalism history. Um, but again, like lo lots of amazing work that I definitely relied on, um, on the lives of the individual women and the choices that they made. Well, we are running up against the end of our times. Did you have, um, let's see, did you have any other, um, comments or thoughts you wanted to leave us with before we start wrapping up? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, feel free to get in touch through my website, which is kimtodd.net. I love to get feedback. Um, and I think that's, I think that's really it. All right. Well, I just dropped the website into the chat box so you can all see it. You can also buy a copy of Kim's book there and you can find the article if you want a preview on the Smithsonian website. And once again, it is sensational. The history of America's Girl Start Reporters. I hope you all have enjoyed this and I'm so grateful that you guys chose to spend some time with us this afternoon. On Thursday, you can come at 6 p.m. if you want to hop on to our next program. We're going to have Elizabeth Navarra from the Library of Congress, who is their women's history librarian, um, sharing about the marketing tactics of the suffragists and how they gained publicity for the suffrage movement and how they innovated a lot of marketing in that way. 
and she'll be using some of the artifacts donated from the National Women's Party at the end of last year. So we hope to see many of you there for that. And if you enjoyed this program and all of the free virtual program we do, please consider hopping on over to our website, alicepaul.org, and making a donation to support us so we can continue to bring these to you. Uh, thank you so much. And Kim, thank you. And have a great afternoon. Yeah, thank you. You as well.